morning, everyone. Welcome back to World Class Inventors. This is video number 29, and this is part two in the series on everything that you should know about non-provisional patents. So the first thing that I want to say is this. You just don't go out and file for a patent. Of course, we went over the provisional patents and the provisional patent application and why you would want to reserve your idea. And it's because you want to end up filing for a non-provisional. So we understand that. But you don't necessarily want to file for a non-provisional just to have it granted to you to hang on the wall and to do nothing. It's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort, and it does entail some expense to get to that point. So why would you want to do this unless you really believe that you have a product that you could make money on? And this is all about making money. Because if you do get a non-provisional utility patent grant, the utility patent grant, it's good for 20 years and it gives you an exclusive in however many countries you file that application in. So that's the whole basis for wanting to get a non-provisional. So I wanna to read to you some excerpts out of my book, the one that I told you um, I would be sharing with you. And I'll just put it up real quick. It's this one. It's 242 pages. It's 13 chapters, 110 separate subsections. I cover hundreds of topics. And I like to believe that it's a definitive book written about inventing, and it comes from my perspective. We begin from the moment you get your idea. We follow it all the way through from protection to the legal, to the marketing, to getting your product out into the marketplace. And it's all done against a couple different backdrops. The first backdrop was I was a young lad in my early 20s, pushing tractor trailers over the road, going 48 states, owning my own couple of rigs, becoming a mechanic, learning about maintenance, uh, fuel economy, fuel efficiency. These machines, when I was driving them, was only getting five to six miles to the gallon on fuel economy, loaded or empty. Your fuel economy would drop if you were driving into a headwind. My particular truck held 13 gallons of oil and it had to be changed once a month back then. So there was expenses and there was fuel economy and oil consumption and filters and a couple few hundred dollars back then to change the oil. That's if you were doing it on your own just for the supplies. So I had this epiphany about oil, oil filtration and oil filters. And I focused my attention on that area. And over time I was awarded two utility patents for oil filters. And those utility patents would matriculate or blossom into what they call benchmark patents and I would say for the last 20 years or so, I have been the most cited inventor in the history of the USPTO for oil filtration. I changed the way that it is viewed, looked at, and marketed on a worldwide basis. The other backdrop we want to take a look at and take into consideration is I basically sold a Fortune 38 company my revolutionary and revelationary idea over the telephone on a cold call. 
and then I went from there. So that's the marketing end of it. That's the inventing end of it, but it doesn't end there. The company I went into business with, Allied Signal slash Fram, turned out to be very unscrupulous. Even though I had signed contracts, signed documents, proprietary information agreements, trade secret agreements, licensing agreements. They still thought that it was in their best interest to go behind my back, cut me out as the inventor and as their business partner. And they went on to file at least 29 patents with my trade secret information and my intellectual portfolio that I had shared with them in its entirety under the protective umbrellas of these documents. So I would end up suing them in court, in uh, federal district court, in the Newark courthouse in Newark, New Jersey. And that battle went on for over four years and they settled with me on the eve of trial on the Friday before Labor Day in 2006. And they settled with me for millions of dollars. And that is a crazy story and we'll get into it way down the road, but I just wanted to give you some background. So the book that I'm going to begin sharing with you in this series has everything to do with what you need to know about non-provisional patents and everything else that I'm going to be sharing with you about. So that's my background and let's get into a couple of excerpts in my book because I think my book is valuable. And if I didn't believe so, I wouldn't be sharing it with you. So I'm on page 13 and it's under the subheading, A Time to Dig. And this is all leading up to filing a non-provisional patent application. Keep that in mind. You must be smarter than the next guy and you must be willing to outwork your opponent. See, developing a patent, de developing a marketing strategy, developing a product strategy in which to go out into the market and grab whatever percentage of market share you can, it's a competition. You have to look at yourself as an athlete, really, I think, or as a gold miner. You're digging for something valuable, you're building towards the future, and you have to have a competitive mentality. You just don't file these documents just to file them and to have them. It's about becoming a millionaire. So that's what this is about. When I was doing my research in the field of oil filtration in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, there wasn't an internet to speak of. At least there wasn't one that I was aware of, nor one that I had access to. I went into that, and in the prior video, I don't know what number it is. You can see it on my, my hit list there on my YouTube channel. I was sharing with you about the Thomas Register and the National Laboratory Consortium as two good resources, two great resources to do research on your idea. That's what I used and it's still applicable today even though we have the internet. So you should be able to do what I did and exponentially more because the internet is really off the scale as far as I'm concerned, as far as a source of information and informational gathering. Is it a good idea? Page 16. 
Let's first start off by being brutally honest about your idea. Is your idea realistic? Will others rush out to buy it once it hits the market? And here's a little personal anecdote. Do you have any idea how many people have approached me? Just in conversation with the most ridiculous ideas. And by the way, I have not met one person in my entire life so far, and I'm 64, who's ever approached me with an idea for a patent and or a product that's ever followed through with it. So I thought there would be more people out there that would be interested in this than what I'm actually coming across. And I find it rather baffling since I've done the best research I could on the internet about the program Shark Tank. And I believe that there's about 10 million viewers a week watching that program. Now, they're watching it because they're being entertained by it. And it is a very good, entertaining uh, television show. However, if you're going to be watching that, in the back of your mind somewhere, you have a bent, a natural bent for ideas, innovation, product development, becoming an inventor. It's in all those viewers to a greater or a lesser degree. I feel that there are millions of you out there that have ideas that you'd like to refine, investigate, and pursue, but you haven't done it because you really haven't found a source of information, whether it be a mentor on YouTube or somebody who's written a book that has it encapsulated from A to Z based upon some achievements and some experience and breadth of knowledge. And that's why you haven't done it. And that's why I'm going to start talking about the book. It's not that I'm going to start hawking the book. It's already splattered all throughout my YouTube website and the links on my uh, YouTube channel. You can go to my, my website and you can look up my books. I'm in Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, and every bookseller that you can imagine. You can go and read excerpt, excerpts of my book. It's because it's a tool. What I'm trying to tell you is I have a tool, not unlike a hammer or a circular saw or a computer that can help you in your quest of becoming an inventor. And this is video number 29. And I'm going to start to unveil the book because I want you to be able to pick it up and use it to your advantage. And it's a material book. It's a paperback. It's affordable. And for those of you who have given up on paper completely, there's an ebook version of this book, which is half the price. So it's a great deal for you to use. As we discussed in the prior video, there is no new idea under the sun that hasn't already been thought about. And it's going to be very, very hard for you to come up with a new original idea. And that's fine. What we're basically doing is we're going in off of existing products, existing marketplaces, and we're going to improve upon it. And it's got to be significant enough that your product is going to be more utilitarian, more expedient, more novel, more useful, more exciting than what is out there. And people will be drawn to it. Not everybody. You're only looking for a percentage of the market. You can't be un you can't be unrealistic. 
So an Old Testament quote taken from the book of Ecclesiastic states, there is nothing new under the sun. From a modern standpoint, one doesn't have to look any further than Albert Einstein's first law of thermodynamics, which puts it in yet another way. Matter can be neither created nor destroyed. So whether you look at it from a biblical standpoint or a practical modern scientific standpoint, you are not creating matter. All the matter that is on this earth is on this earth. It's not going to be restored or replenished or sent down from up above. It's here. So all the elements you need as an inventor, as a product developer is here. And you will not be creating any new matter. That is not within the capabilities of humans. That's within the capability of a divine creator if you believe in that. That is something that God and God alone does. And he already did it. He left it here for us to use. So as I said in the prior videos, the very first thing you need to do with your idea, and it's very personal, and it's spiritual, and it's competitive, and it's going to set you off on the journey. It's this. The very first thing that you must do with your new idea is to claim it. Now, I faced a lot of different hardships, adversities, um, how to figure it out, how to go forward, how to market it was, was a brutal mountain that I had to climb, how to finally get into a major corporation that could do this. That was no small feat. So you have to take this on as if you are an Olympic athlete in training. I'm very serious. So that's what I want to get to you. Getting wealthy from your invention is a noble enterprise if it's done the honest way. That means integrity must always come first. If you compromise your integrity in the process, process of inventing, then you're stealing. Now, under the United States Code, USC 35, 115, and 116, and an affidavit that you will be signing for the USPTO in the United States for your non-provisional patent application, not for your provisional, but your non-provisional, the one with the claims. The patent office wants to know, are you the first true inventor? Is it your idea? Is it your idea alone? Or are you collaborating? And if you're collaborating, that's fine. They want to know it and you have to disclose it and you have to disclose the other inventor's name as well. So integrity must come first. So I'm only on page 12 and I've only read you a couple of quotes. And I guess story time is going to continue in the next video. And uh, we'll work our way up to non-provisional patents. And I'm just trying to lay the groundwork and the foundation as to why you should want to get a non-provisional patent. It's not about the award. It's not about the trophy. It's not about the patent plaque that you can buy. It's about you coming up with something truly unique, novel, that you can make money from. Hopefully, you can make enough money from so that you're not as tied to the work clock as you would normally be. And so you don't have to wor work out your 40 year time clock and you can start to cut that time clock down and enjoying the very, very limited amount of time 
that God has all given us on this planet before we leave it. So that's what it's about. I hope you enjoyed this little ditty I did. I'll be doing more of them. And um, I'll see you in the next video. God bless each and every one of you. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye.